Member statements. The member for Toronto St. Paul's. Today I rise for every Jana in St. Paul's who has been unprotected by WSIB. For every injured worker who, like Jana, has spent countless years fighting for benefits, the mental and physical anguish of having to prove one's injuries and subsequent disabilities over and over again with mountains of proof from doctors, specialists, five neurologists Jana has dealt with at some points, still being denied benefits. Jana was injured in March of 2014 and by October of 2019 still hadn't received a penny from WSIB. Jana reached the six-year mark in 2020, and even then, WSIB claimed she could work, even though CPP disability thought otherwise. In January of 2021, WSIB threatened to cut what little benefits finally trickled if she didn't attend an in-person assessment during the heights of the pandemic, when WSIB workers were working from home and most doctor's appointments had long shifted online. Seven and a half years after being injured at WorkSpeaker and Jana is still fighting for scraps and has no answer on the permanency of her benefits. This government has designed WSIB to protect the employer and not injured workers. This doesn't only hurt the worker speaker, it, work, it hurts the entire family. This Conservative government puts its buddies ahead of working people. I'm calling on this government to change its ways and redirect unused funds held by WSIB to supporting injured workers like Jana instead of giving the money back to their buddies and billionaire employers. Speaker, the government needs to say yes to Jana and, and, and the near 50 per cent of injured workers living in poverty. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member statements. The member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, Speaker, building on the work of Ontario's Greenbelt approach, I propose we consider a further broadening under what is referred to as the Blue Belt. My hometown paper, the Port Dover Maple Leaf, published an article titled "Has the Time Now Come to Protect Our Blue Belt?" The author, Hannah Harrison proposes a new concept to protect our Great Lakes uh, fishing heritage and economy. The Blue Belt proposal suggests many of the same protections of multi-pronged policy approaches to Great Lakes economies, culture, and food systems that <clears throat> we find in Ontario's Green Belt that deal with agricultural and environmentally sensitive lands subject to urban sprawl and development. Harrison, proposes broadening Ontario's right to farm legislation, the Farming and Food Protection Act, to also conserve, protect, and encourage development and improvement of Ontario's fisheries. She also makes the case for zoning modernization to safeguard waterfront access and infrastructure for the marine trades and water-dependent businesses. This approach to zoning helps prevent some types of development, such as residential or commercial, that don't require water access from encroaching on our waterfronts. Further to this, I've introduced and debated a piece of proposed legislation titled the Great Lakes Protection and Proportion Act. Coupled with the Blue Belt concept, there's potential to open the door for some concrete action on this. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> member statements. The member for Kiwetanong. Uh, miigwet, Speaker. Uh, last week, I had a chance to visit uh, uh, and spent time in Kitchenamaxa Beninawak, which is in Treaty 9 territory. On July 5, 1929, the Treaty Commissioners came to uh, KI to sign an ad ad adhesion to Treaty Number 9. The elders talked about uh, this time using the phrase, which means, I will look after you. This is what the elders remember from the treaty discussions in 1929. These elders understood the rights that came from the treaty promises, and they knew that they were sacred and to be respected. Is, uh, how do we reconcile the idea with all the boil water advisories, the poor housing, the poverty, the underfunding of children's services, the continual high removal of our children by the ch child welfare system, the high suicide rates, and the lack of land base as all of our lands are now part of the Crown. This has never been and never will be, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, acceptable. This is not what our ancestors signed the treaty for, to be paupers of our own land. It is not what they agreed, agreed to, for as long as the sun shines, the grass grows, and the rivers flow. 
the time is overdue for the governments of Ontario and Canada to wake up and start living up to their treaty promises. Miigwech. Thank you very much. Member Statements, the member for Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in late August, I was notified of the death of Margaret Mackay at her home in Toronto. She was 102 years old. Margaret was the last surviving grandchild of Reverend George Leslie Mackay, one of the famous sons of Oxford. George Leslie Mackay is celebrated both here in Ontario and in Taiwan, where he was the first Canadian missionary to that country. He established some of the first churches and schools, including Oxford College which was supported by funds raised by the people in Oxford County. George Leslie Mackay brought many skills with him to support the residents where he ministered. He knew basic frontier medicine. He established a ruminary dentistry practice and some of his first medical clinics. His legacy is still seen in Taiwan today in many ways, from the Mackay Memorial Hospital in Taipei to children's storybooks. The Presbyterian Church in Taiwan prepared a tribute to granddaughter Margaret, which included the following, and I quote, the faith and mission heritage of the Mackay family and others who served alongside them continues in this land for which they will be forever thankful to God. We are grateful for the bonds of friendship between our nations, which they help forge and enrich as ambassadors of Christ. Mr. Speaker, it's been almost 150 years since George Leslie Mackay arrived in Taiwan as a missionary. To this day, we continue to promote and foster the international relations that he and his legacy have set into motion. Thank you. Member Statements. The member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Before, whenever November would, would begin, I would always feel angry. I'd feel upset. Why wouldn't I? Imagine if your government burnt your fathers, your brothers, and your sons alive in the streets. Kerosene poured on heads, tires placed around necks. Imagine if your government raped your daughters, your mothers, and your sisters. That is precisely what the Indian government did to Sikhs across India in November 1984. And I was born in 1984, so every year that passes is a reminder to me of how we haven't done enough. We haven't done enough to the survivors who still languish in poverty. We haven't done enough to fight for justice. We haven't done enough to remember the countless six who were killed. And that's why I'm no longer angry. I'm just sad. And that's why I will continue to say, never forget 1984, until the world knows about the sick genocide and until the sick people have the justice that we deserve. Farmers across India have been protesting the mass privatization of farming at the hands of the Indian government. For over a year now, they've been protesting, and they've faced everything from freezing nights to blazing days and state violence. And that's why today I stand and I continue to call each and every one of us to stand in support of farmers, because when there are no farmers, there is no food. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The member for Chatham-Kent Leamington. Mr. Speaker, there continues to be mounting evidence regarding the use of inexpensive repurposed medicines to treat COVID-19 in the early phases. Now, this is based on numerous clinical trials and population data, which includes the experience of many frontline physicians globally. Now, recently, doctors from around the world gathered in Rome for an international COVID summit to discuss the early outpatient treatment and share that information with the international community. It was determined that the effects of therapeutic nihilism, that is to not treat the patient early, allows the virus to replicate unimpeded, which will result in a portion of them being hospitalized or even dying. Sadly, the Ontario Science Table supports therapeutic nihilism. Now, hospital put, hospitals put patients on expensive remdesivir with no evidence of efficacy. There are, however, reports of liver and kidney damage. In November of 2020, the WHO stated that uh, use of this drug was not effective. There's an old saying, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. More natural and preventative ways of strengthening your immune system include the use of vitamin C, D, zinc, ivermectin, quercetin, and even hydroxychloroquine. So let's not shame the vaccine hesitant and therefore creating a two-tier society. Why, as one nurse recently asked, do the protected need to be protected from the unprotected 
by forcing the unprotected to use a protection that did not protect the protected in the first place. Thank you, Speaker. Member Statements. The member for Kitchener-Conestoga. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This year marks the 100th anniversary of Canadians wearing poppies to remember the sacrifice of veterans who stood up for our country. Every year on November 11th, when I'm in front of the Cenotaph, it hits me that my job to represent Kitchener-Conestoga is only possible because of those who are willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. It is these brave men and women who stood up to tyranny and hatred who have made it possible for us to take our seats in this chamber. This is something that should be not lost on any of us, Mr. Speaker. I recently joined some volunteers in Wellesley Township who, when they learned about this year's centennial anniversary, they started a project to honour the township's veterans. Beth Schluter, Karen Pilecki, Wendy Richardson and Barb Nowak have spent the past six months collecting and knitting poppies for a display at the Wellesley Township offices. With over 2,000 poppies made by people from all over the township and supplies donated by Home Hardware and Yancey Electric, the poppy project was officially unveiled last Friday. I want to thank all of those who donated time, supplies, and money for this display of remembrance in honour of our local veterans. I'd also like to recognize our Premier and new Minister of Citizenship and Multiculturalism for introducing legislation to protect the rights of workers to wear a poppy on the job. It is so difficult for me to understand why we need a law like this, Mr. Speaker, but I will be putting my full support behind it to make sure that all Ontarians have the protected right to remember our veterans. Thank you. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Sudbury. Speaker. Speaker, the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference unites the world to accelerate action towards our collective goals of addressing climate change. CNN recently described this as the world's last best chance at tackling climate change, and it's a good thing that Sudbury has sent one of our best to represent us. The climate crisis is the greatest threat our world faces, and Sophia Mather from Sudbury has been inspiring our community since she was seven years old about how to tackle this. Spoiler alert, Speaker, she thinks we should listen to the experts. Sophia is a friend and she's the epitome of youth leadership. Sophia was the first student outside of Europe to participate in the Fridays for Future student strike movement. She has met with Al Gore and marched with Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg. Sophia has lobbied at Tom Davies Square in Sudbury, Parliament Hill in Ottawa, right here at Queen's Park in Toronto. In fact, Speaker, Sophia is the lead youth plaintiff in the Echo Justice lawsuit against the current Ontario government for weakening, uh, weakening Ontario's 2030 climate target. Sophia is one of 25 young environmental activists across the globe to be honoured by Action for Nature as a 2021 international young eco-hero. She's featured in the documentary Citizen Kid, Earth Comes First, and she'll be one of six youths to be featured in the documentary In Your Hands with Prince Charles and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Speaker, Sophia Mather is inspiring youth and adults across the world with her tenacity we cannot fail her or any of our children on this issue. Sudbury is extremely proud of 14-year-old Sophia and all of her accomplishments. I join our community in wishing her the best at the Climate Change Conference. And as a representative, I'll continue to echo her calls to listen to the experts. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Premier Ford has always said, Thanks to the people of Ontario, we are seeing fewer coronavirus cases compared to the other major urban areas in North America. Speaker, the most important contributor to this great achievement is our higher vaccination rate. However, in Down Valley North, the vaccination rate remains low at about 73% only compared to the city of Toronto and the province. As such, I have initiated the Every Shot Mothers vaccination awareness campaign in my riding. Door hangers were distributed, distributed to each household, and the lawn sign were placed at people's property and local businesses. Speaker, I am thankful that after the combined efforts of our last mile strategy, the GoVax Mobile Vaccination Clinic and the Every Short Mother's camp, uh, vac vaccination campaign, we will catch up with the provincial average and uh, for the protect the people of Ontario and Don Valley North. Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity 
to thank all of my team and volunteers who work tirelessly to make this happen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our member's statements for this morning.